Shepard, and I'm the Advanced Clinical Specialist for High Risk OB at St. Joseph's Women's Hospital, and I'm here to talk to you today about preterm labor. Preterm birth is any birth before 37 weeks gestation. The mortality, the patient is two times as likely to die before their first birthday, and preterm birth is responsible for 27% of neonatal deaths worldwide approximately 1 million annually. Morbidity, patients are more likely to have respiratory distress syndrome, interventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis, also known as NEC. It affects one in eight births, and it's serious and costly. It's most costly if the baby delivers before 32 weeks, which is 2% of all births. The definition of preterm labor is cervical change or effacement in uterine contractions that occur between 20 or 36 and 6 sevenths weeks gestation. The clinical criteria for diagnosis is 20 to 36 and 6 sevenths weeks gestation and documented uterine contractions, 4 every 20 minutes or 8 every hour, and documented cervical effacement of 80% or cervical dilation of more than 2 centimeters. the pathophysiology or causes of preterm labor. It's usually multifactorial. You can have genetics, environmental, usually incurring personal behaviors like smoking or drugs, maternal fetal stress. Usually there's corticotropin releasing hormone that may stimulate a production of a cascade of other hormones that trigger uterine contractions. You can have inflammation and infection, things like genital, urinary, or periodontal disease. You can have bleeding, an abruption can trigger release of various proteins involved in blood clotting, which also appear to stimulate uterine contractions. Or you can have uterine stretching, such as overdistension, secondary multiples or polyhydraminos, uterine and placental anomalies that can lead to the release of chemicals that can stimulate uterine contractions. Let's look at the risk factors. The biggest risk factor for preterm birth is a previous preterm delivery. That's her highest risk factor that's going to put her into preterm labor this time. Other risk factors would be things like hypertension, diabetes, clotting disorders, low pre-pregnancy weight, obesity, later no prenatal care, smoking, alcohol, illicit drugs, domestic violence, race, age less than or greater than 17 years or 35 years, a low socioeconomic status, genetics, using assisted reproductive technologies to get pregnant, presence of infection, especially in the genitourinary tract, presence of fetal anomalies, premature rupture of membranes, vaginal bleeding, or presence of periodontal disease. Signs and symptoms of preterm labor. You should consider the diagnosis of preterm labor until you rule it out. Any uterine cramping that's intermittent or constant. Uterine contractions every 10 to 15 minutes. Any low abdominal pressure or pelvic pressure. A dull low backache that's constant or intermittent. If the patient complains of an increase or change in vaginal discharge. If she's feeling that the baby is pushing down. Any abdominal cramping with or without diarrhea. Any vomiting. Diarrhea or increase in bowel movements from normal. Or a change in pain levels or response to pain meds, especially if previously the pain meds were effective, but now they're not. Really, you just need to have a conversation with your patient if she's got the presence of any of these symptoms. Figure out what's going on with her. Maybe she has the flu, but maybe she doesn't. And you need to be suspicious that she's got preterm labor until you can absolutely rule it out. If any of these signs or symptoms occur, you should, the woman should notify the nurse to be put on the fetal monitor. She should lie down on her side. And you as the nurse need to consider checking her urine for specific gravity if you're concerned she's dehydrated. Have her drink two to three glasses of water or juice, but don't, no need to have her guzzle it. 
have her empty her bladder if it's full, report findings to the healthcare provider if more than eight uterine contractions occur in an hour. Written specific criteria. Some providers prefer to be notified for more than six contractions in an hour depending on what the patient's specific diagnosis is. Clinical criteria are poorly predictive until labor is well established. And identifying women with preterm contractions who will deliver preterm is a very inexact process. Sometimes the overdiagnosis of preterm labor is common. 30% of preterm labors occur spontaneously. And only 13% of women that present at less than 34 weeks with specific criteria for preterm labor will be delivered within one week. 50% of our patients that are hospitalized for preterm labor will deliver at term. Less than 10% of the women with a clinical diagnosis of preterm labor actually give birth within seven days of their presentation. Okay, so it's not a pregnant belly, but it's a pretty distraction. Now, how should we evaluate these patients when they come to us? We should do vital signs, a fetal heart rate, contraction pattern and intensity, and manual palpation of their contraction pattern is a must. So you have to be good at manually palpating contractions, checking at the fundus, and knowing whether the contractions are soft, moderate, or hard. Reviewing her past medical history, her past obstetrical history, and her current obstetrical history. Evaluate for the signs and symptoms of current preterm labor and looking at those risk factors that we just discussed a minute ago. Doing a speculum exam, which um, you may or may not have already completed the online training for that. Looking at her cervical dilation and effacement. Is she bleeding? What's the status of her membranes? Are they already ruptured? Are they bulging? Obtaining a fetal fibronectin, send it only for cervical length is less than 30 millimeters. Do a digital cervical exam only after a fetal fibronectin is obtained. Labs, if they're clinically indicated, do a GBS culture, a GC and chlamydia, bacterial vaginosis, trichomonasis, and a urine drug screen. Ultrasound. If one is ordered, it needs to, you need to check for her amniotic fluid. Where's her placenta located? Where's the baby laying? Are there any fetal anomalies or abnormalities? What's her cervical length? It's useful to support the diagnosis of preterm labor. Does she have a short cervical length of less than 25 millimeters? If so, before 28 weeks gestation, it's highly predictive of preterm birth. Cervical length is normally stable between 14 to 28 weeks gestation, but can decline substantially after 28 to 32 weeks. And if it's below the 10th percentile at 25 millimeters, it's consistently associated with an increased risk of spontaneous preterm birth. It's highly unlikely in symptomatic patients with a cervical length greater than 30 millimeters unless an abruption is the cause of her symptoms. And there is no threshold value that establishes the diagnosis of preterm labor or predicts which patient will always deliver preterm. 25% or one quarter of the women with no measurable cervix at 14 to 28 weeks gestation will deliver after 32 weeks. And as cervical length decreases in the second trimester, the risk of spontaneous preterm birth does increase. So let's talk about fetal fibronectin. We've mentioned obtaining a special protein or glue-like substance at the utero-placental junction that literally kind of holds the baby in place in the womb. It's an extracellular matrix glycoprotein. It's produced in the decidual shells in the uterus. It's theorized that preterm labor breaks the bonds between the placenta 
and the amniotic membranes releasing fetal fibronectin into the vaginal secretions. And if a woman is in preterm labor, fetal fibronectin may be detected before week 35. After the 33th week of pregnancy, it begins to break down naturally and is It helps predict the risk of preterm delivery in symptomatic patients with a cervical length of less than 20 millimeters, and it's used in conjunction with cervical length. 75% of women with cervical length less than 15 millimeters and a positive fetal fibronectin delivered within seven days. And 50% of women with a cervical length less than 30 millimeters and positive fetal fibronectin delivered within 14 days. It has a high negative predictive value. In 99.5% of women presenting with signs and symptoms of preterm labor with a negative fetal fibronectin failed to deliver within seven days. So who's a candidate for fetal fibronectin testing? If their gestational age is 22 to 34 weeks, they have intact membranes, and their cervical dilation is less than three centimeters. The sample's detected from the posterior fornix, so we use a speculum here at St. Joseph's Women's Hospital to collect the speculum, specul specimen, especially if nursing is collecting the specimen. Home uterine activity monitoring, there's really no scientific evidence against it. Um, bed rest, again, there's no scientific evidence rather to support it. IV hydration, cervical collage, cerclage, and prophylactic antibiotics, again, no scientific evidence to support it. P 17P or progesterone, it is associated with prolonged gestation. Fetal fibronectin is used as a predictor of those who will not experience preterm labor and preterm birth. And cervical length measurements, um, there is some use of it in at least predicting who um, may have preterm labor. So tocolytics. They're given for 24 to 48 hours in order to allow time for antenatal glucocorticoids to help mature the fetal lungs, but all tocolytics have major Let's look at terbutaline first. It's a beta agonist. It has an off-label use. It works by relaxing the smooth muscle, which decreases or stops uterine contractions. It rapidly crosses the placenta. You need to monitor maternal heart rate, so she needs to be on a pulse oximeter and do not give it if the heart rate is greater than 120 beats per minute. The side effects, you can have chest heaviness, shortness of breath, chest pain. The dosing is usually 0.25 milligrams sub-Q, and it's contraindicated in patients with known cardiac disease. Magnesium sulfate. It's the most commonly used tocolytic. It's also an off-label use. Magnesium interferes with calcium uptake in the cells of the myometrium. It's used for decreasing the amount of calcium or it stops contractions. Magnesium sulfate relaxes smooth muscle throughout the body and a decrease in blood pressure may be observed. You want to monitor the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturation, deep tinted reflexes, and level of consciousness. Your side effects that you're going to see are flushing, headache, nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, chest pain, you could see pulmonary edema, constipation, calcium excretion, affection, and, and affecting bone mineralization. Normally it's administered with a four to six gram loading dose and a two gram maintenance. Some, dose, some places are using Procardia or Nifedipine as we are on our unit causes the myometrial muscle to relax by interfering with the movement of calcium into the calcium channels. The fetal side effects, decreased uteral placental blood flow, fetal hypoxia, and fetal bradycardia. There is a potential for fetal tachycardia. Maternal side effects, tachycardia, palpitations, headache, facial flushing, ankle edema, hepatotoxicity. Should not be used in cardiovascular compromise, intrauterine infection, multiple pregnancies, maternal hypertension, or cardiac disease. Your dosage initially 10 milligrams, then 10 to 20 milligrams every 
indocin or indomethacin is a prostaglandin inhibitor. The fetal side effects, it may cause premature closure of the fetal ductus arteriosus, increasing the risk of fetal pulmonary hypertension. It also impairs fetal renal function, which may result in oligohydramnios. Your dosage initially 50 milligrams, then 25 to 50 milligrams every six to eight hours. Limited to 48 hours and less than 32 weeks gestation. You want to watch for hyperbilirubinemia in the neonate. Hang in there, you're doing great. Seventeen P or seventeen alpha hydroxyprogesterone caparate. It's a compounded drug, naturally occurring metabolite of progesterone. It's thought to relax the uterine muscle and or have anti inflammatory effects and inhibit, in cervical, inhibit cervical ripening. It's used only in women with one prior preterm birth, and it comes as an injectable, vaginal suppository, capsule, which is called Prometrium, and a gel Prochieve. The dosing it, when given IEM, it's usually 250 milligrams IEM one time weekly, starting at 16 weeks until 36 and 6 sevenths weeks gestation. If it's given as a cap, gel, or suppository, the dosing is 100 to 200 milligrams daily. Now let's talk antenatal corticosteroids. They're used for the prevention of respiratory distress syndrome and neonatal mortality. They appear to decrease respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and neonatal necrotizing enterocolitis in the neonate. They may cause decreased birth weight and head circumference if given over long periods of time or in multiple series, which is why we don't do that. They should be administered to all women at high risk for preterm delivery unless delivery is anticipated within one to two hours. And they should not be withheld if delivery is anticipated prior to completion of the full course. Given between 24 and 34 weeks gestation with signs of preterm labor. The neonatal benefits accrue within 6 to 8 hours of administration and the effects last for up to 7 days. With corticosteroids, there's two options. There's betamethasone, which is given as 12 milligrams IM every 24 hours times 2 doses, or dexamethasone, which is 6 milligrams IM every 12 hours times 2 doses. Betamethasone, you want to watch your baby for an increased baseline, decreased variability, and decreased accelerations. And it actually can affect your BPP, decreasing your score overall. And betamethasone is the, the um, corticosteroid that we use more often here at St. Joe's Women's Hospital. Dexamethasone, on the other hand, does not appear to affect the fetal heart rate characteristics. Now, you can give a rescue course of antenatal corticosteroids, which is a single course of steroids that should be considered in women whose prior course of antenatal corticosteroids were administered at least seven days previously and who remain at risk of preterm birth before 34 weeks gestation. Now, regularly scheduled repeat courses or multiple courses, more than two, are not recommended because of the previous um, thing that I mentioned where it can cause a decrease in um, birth weight and head circumference. Let's talk about a quick protocol for management of symptomatic preterm labor. A history and physical examination should be done. She should have a speculum exam. You want to obtain the swab for fetal fibronectin if the gestational age is between 22 and 34 weeks, like we talked about at the very beginning when she's first admitted. You want to obtain the rectovaginal GBS culture and urine culture. Screen for sexually transmitted infection, bacterial vaginosis, and her substance abuse if clinically indicated. A obstetrical ultrasound examination and transvaginal cervical length assessment if less than 28 weeks gestation. Send the fetal fibronectin to the laboratory if the cervix measures less than 30 millimeters and perform a digital examination after obtaining the fetal fibronectin swab and ruling out a placenta previa. Women with a negative fetal fibronectin or a cervix greater than 30 millimeters may be discharged from labor and delivery after a short observational period and that would include our unit on the high-risk OB unit. Women with a positive fetal fibronectin or a cervix less than 20 millimeters or evidence of cervical change may benefit from antenatal corticosteroids and tocolysis.
and they should receive betamethasone 12 milligrams IM every 12 hours for t every 24 hours for two doses. Indomethacin 50 milligrams oral loading dose followed by 25 milligrams orally every six hours for a total of 48 hours before 32 weeks gestation or nifedipine 30 milligrams oral loading dose followed by 20 milligrams orally every six hours for a total of 48 hours after 32 weeks gestation and GBS prophylaxis if appropriate. Let's talk about magnesium for neuro fetal neuroprotection. It may be administered to women between 24 to 32 weeks gestation with a high likelihood of delivery within 12 hours. That's generally given as a 6 gram loading dose over 20 to 30 minutes followed by 2 grams per hour maintenance infusion until delivery or 12 hours have elapsed. And you may consider a single dose of betamethasone 12 milligrams IM administered as a rescue course if the prior course of antenatal corticosteroids was administered at least seven days previously. Research suggests that magnesium sulfate strengthens cell wall integrity, lessens hypoxic damage, and protects against cytokine or excitatory amino acid damage. It may assist low birth weight infants to experience more intact cerebral vessel integrity, thus minimizing damage to tissue and reducing cerebral palsy. Thank you for your time and attention to this lecture on preterm labor. Hopefully it has helped you feel more prepared to take care of our patients who will be visiting us on the high-risk OB unit in preterm labor who might be receiving continuous fetal monitoring.